Sorry. Okay. So let, let us bless them and let us show our appreciation to these people. And of course, those who are carrying boxes of food every Sunday, uh, without them, you will get hungry okay, on Sunday. And um, I, I really praise God because uh, I woke up at uh, 0.130 hours this morning. And after that, I kind of longer sleep. And there was that spirit of heaviness. And I immediately texted uh, some of our leaders, some of our prayers, prayer partners, and really asked them to pray, OK? Because I know I'm going to preach. And while I was lying in bed, a lot of things are going in my mind, like uh, the devil is trying to tell me you're going back to the hospital. Things like that, because as you all are aware, I had a stroke uh, last year, and, and the devil is injecting those thoughts in my mind. That's why early in the morning, I texted them and asked them to pray for me. And then on our way here, we were in a standstill. So you know, you're, you feel anxious, you feel the heaviness, and then you're in a standstill in the traffic. But you know, praise God, because God uses people. When I came in, I went to JR. By the way, let's, uh, uh, let's appreciate JR, okay? I went to JR and I asked him, hey JR, how are you doing? And two words, he said, don't be anxious. Ah, three ba? Don't be three. You see, I'm just trying to find out if you guys are awake. You, 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 you know when people listen to God, they are able to bless other people. So JR, thank you. And, and that burden was lifted. Okay. That, that heaviness was lifted because of a person who said, don't be anxious. So I would encourage all of you I would encourage all of you, if, if you feel like the Lord is asking you to say some encouraging words to other people, don't hesitate to do it. Amen? Amen? Amen. So, uh, since we started our, oh, before we go to that, I think, we need to pray. Is it all right with you that we pray? Are you sure? Okay, let's bow down our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for your good. Thank you that you're a God who takes care of your children. And in humility, Lord, we ask, Lord, that you take over our service this morning. God, I pray that you will override my preparation. Lord, I'm limited in many things, but we know that we serve a limitless God. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness and loving kindness for bringing us here. Lord, we also pray, Lord God, for those who have been affected by um, Hurricane Ian. Lord, I ask, Lord God, that you move in their means and that these people, Lord, will start looking to you and not look at the government or look at anybody else but you alone. Thank you, Lord, that you can calm the sea, you can calm the typhoon, you can calm whatever, uh, even the earthquake, Lord, because you're a sovereign God. Lord, we commit, we even pray for this country. We pray for our president, President Joe Biden and the Vice President Kamala Harris. Will you direct their paths, Lord? Will you show them the way? I ask, dear Father God, that righteousness, Lord God, will rule in this nation. And we declare 
that Jesus is Lord over America. We even pray for Israel. God, we ask for peace in that nation and that may your kingdom come and your will be done. Lord God, happen in that nation and that your people will get to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So again, good morning for those of you who are watching online. Welcome. For those of you in CCF South and CCF North, welcome. Okay, and look at the person next to you and say good morning. Okay. And, and of course, we have our uh, friends from the Chinese community. Ni hao. Okay. Okay. Um, there will be, we, we will be doing something unique this morning because today is, what? Communion Sunday. Okay. And uh, what we're going to do is, uh, at the middle of my message, we will group into fours. Okay. And then the D group leaders will institute the Lord's Supper. Okay, that's what we're going to do later. Um, and since we started meeting in person in April, we have tackled God's love, right? If you remember our message, our messages during that time, and then it followed with intimacy with the Lord. Okay, uh, I hope you guys are blessed and are improving in your intimacy with God. Um, and then we went into prayer. Okay, and it is really, um, I'm really blessed to know that uh, there are a lot of people who have deepened their prayer life. Okay, and of course, we went into worship. So when we started having series on worship, what, what really made me so excited is when I saw a lot of you step up and begin to worship God. Okay? So as, as you're aware, worship is, not only for, uh, worship is not only for a few or worship is not only for... Uh, um, for our worship leaders, okay? But worship is for everyone. Okay, amen? Okay. I think money and we need to look for a new place, huh? You know, just, just, just to share with you, just to share with you, God is moving in our midst. Um, our CCF North, actually, they are now going to occupy, starting today, two rooms because they are starting their children's ministry. Okay? And for the past few Sundays that I was there, they are almost full pack. So one of the things that I'd like you to pray with us is for God to provide a permanent place a place that we can, we can call our own. Okay? We need a bigger place, right? Yes. We need a place for our children. We need a place for us to enjoy and really call our home. Right, Joel? Yes. And, and, and I believe God, God, God is really moving. Okay? Another thing, please block your calendar. December 11th. We are going to have our first CCF SoCal musical dinner. Okay, the attire is, oh, it's there. Okay, so black that off. We are going to have this in uh, Griffith Park Friendship Hall. The capacity of the place is 500 to 600. 500, okay? We have booked about 250, but, but we want you to bring your friends. Let's fill it to capacity, okay? However, 
we will be asking you to register so that we will have enough food for everybody. If you don't register, we will only give you lollipop. Okay? Because uh, we will have to pay for the food. And of course, it's going to be free for us. It's our CCF's way of saying thank you and Merry Christmas to everybody. But you need to register. Okay? RSVP. Amen? Okay. So let's go back. Um, since we started April, we have different series. And uh, the next series that's in line is about the presence of God. It's going to be a nice series talking about the presence of God. However, for today, since it is Communion Sunday, we will have a series break. Now, as you are aware, we are gathering here in person, but our brethren from CCF South and CCF East are watching us online. I know some of you, it has come to my attention, that some of you do not want to go to church anymore because we are on video. I encourage you, you don't go to church because of the, of the speaker. We go to church because we want to find Jesus. We go to church because we want to encounter the presence of God. Be it video, be it in person, God will move in the hearts of people. Because God is powerful. God does not respect whether you have a celebrity speaker here or not. God looks at the heart. After all, we live not to please CCF, not to please anybody else, but to please our maker. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. Those of you in the north, can I hear an amen? I don't hear anything. Oh, because you're not going to... Okay, those in the south, can I hear an amen? Okay. <laughs> How many of you here likes to eat? All of you likes to eat, right? Uh, those who doesn't want to eat, can you raise your hands? Okay, because later on, we are going to eat. We are going to share meal. Okay? You know, um, I discovered that in the Bible, I, I also discovered that Jesus likes to eat. Jesus likes to eat. Because when he was here, he was 100% human. And in fact, Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and he got hungry. That means he had the desire to eat. If you look at the Bible, there are actually tons of verses that refers to fellowship or having meals together. Meal is actually a universal thing. Wherever we go, people eat. When you go, when, when you are in the Philippines, people like the Buddha fight, uh, the Buddha meal, right? When you go to, to Mexico, they have nice burrito, the, especially the wet burrito, etc., so on and so forth, right? When you go to China, I lived in China for two years, I enjoy seeing Chinese people as a family gather in restaurants. They love to eat. Tony, do you like to eat? Okay, so eating or having a meal is a universal thing. When there's a wedding, we eat. When there's a birthday celebration, right? There's pizza, there's Coke. Cleveland is smiling. He likes to eat. Right? There's always, when people celebrate, there is always 
And celebration is not very exciting unless there is food. In fact, when, when the president of other nations would come, or when Joe Biden went to Israel, they offered him food. They call it state dinners. When they sign a contract, they always eat. You know, in the New Testament, I noticed that Jesus likes to eat. In fact, he, wants, he likes to go to gatherings. Remember during the wedding at Cana, Canaan? Jesus was there. Don't tell me that Jesus was just watching them eat. Probably Jesus would go to the kitchen because they, Mary told him that they ran out of wine. Probably Jesus was getting some food there and, you know, trying it. I can just imagine. Just like what I normally do. Remember when you have lichon? Much. People like it. In fact, Jesus had the meal with Zacchaeus. And in fact, Jesus fed 5,000 people. The disciples want to send the 5,000 people home. But Jesus, no, 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 no. Let's give them food. Probably Jesus was already hungry. Probably he was just shy or ashamed to tell them, I'm also hungry. Right? And you know, after the resurrection, remember Peter and some other disciples, they went fishing. And when they come to the shore, who did they meet? Met Jesus. And what was he doing? Preparing breakfast for them. You know, if Jesus was a Filipino, probably he would be cooking daeng, bongos, and fried egg to you with, with kamatis, right? Or if, you know, if Jesus was an American, probably some sausages. Okay, you know, I have a story. So there was these friends, they were arguing. Like yesterday, me, Manny, and, and George, you're watching right now. We were having fun. We were just debating on something. Okay? These friends were also debating. They were debating who Jesus was and what culture. Sounds test. Okay. Can you hear me now? I need to use microphone because of the streaming. If I don't use mic, they will not hear us. Okay, so they were arguing. They were saying that Jesus was an American. And then somebody said, no, Jesus was, was French. And then there was this Filipino guy. You know, Jesus is a Filipino because he likes to eat. And then the, when they went to heaven... A big tall guy named Jesus went out the door and he said, Buenos dias. <laughs> okay. So now I have your attention. You know, the sto even the story of the prodigal son. When the prodigal son went home, what did the father do? He said, prepare the fattened calf we are going to have a celebration. Normally, meals are done, or in the, in the Bible, they always have meals when there is a covenant. In the Bible, you have the Old Testament and the New Testament, or we call it the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. What was the Old Covenant? The Old Covenant started with Abraham. God initiated a covenant with men through Abraham. And what did he say? I will multiply your seed. I will make you a great nation. And people who bless you will be blessed. 
and people who curse you will be cursed. That was the covenant given by God to Abraham. But what happened? The wife of Abraham was already old and barren. Okay, her name is Sarah. Actually, Sarah is Chinese, I think. Yeah, because her last name is Do, Sarado. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so she was barren. But God, God made a promise. God made a promise. And after some time, God responded or answered the promise. But before the promise came, it started with the covenant meal. Remember Abraham? He was in the tent. And then God came through an angel and they had meal together. And remember, it was also the time that Sarah laughed when she heard that she will have a son. There was a meal before the covenant came into being. If you look at Genesis chapter 26, there's also a story of Isaac and Abimelech. That when they made the covenant that they will not harm each other, they had meal together. In verse 30 of Genesis 26, it says, So he made them a feast, and they ate and drank. So they had a meal. In Genesis chapter 31, verses 44 to 46, Laban made a covenant with Jacob. In verse 46, it says, Then Jacob said to his brethren, Gather stones, and they took stones and made a heap, and they ate there on the heap. And many more instances where you can see that people have a meal together after a covenant or an agreement was made. The children of Israel were given a promise. Remember, they were under bondage in the land of Egypt. They were in bondage for 400 years. And the promise given to them by God is, I will deliver you out of bondage. And guess what? They left Egypt on the Passover night when God instructed them that you and your families will come together and have a meal. Are you seeing the pattern? That every promise that God has given men, there is always a meal attached to it. I was thinking probably in heaven there's a lot of food. Not because we're hungry but because God would want us to enjoy. The title of my message this morning is God Prepared a Meal for You. God, say that with me, God prepared a meal for you. I'm sure many of you memorize Psalms 23. What is Psalms 23? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But we will focus this morning on verse 5. It says, You prepare a table befo before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. While I was meditating on this verse last Friday night, the picture came to my mind. I was just imagining how the picture would look like. That picture that came to my mind is probably God was preparing food for Vilma. For Vilma, I'm sorry. She was preparing food. He was preparing food in a long table. And then God placed the food on the table for her to eat, for you to eat. And outside God's mansion, the devil is there just looking. Unfortunately, the devil cannot come 
because of God's presence. You know, God has prepared a meal for you. And when you come to the table or the meal with God, the good news is the devil cannot touch you because of the presence of God. The devil cannot touch you because of the presence of God when you have a meal with our Abba Father. Can you imagine that? Probably some of you will ask, what is that meal? I'm, gl I'm glad you're asking that. Is it a meal from El Polio Loco? Is it a meal from Orchid Garden? Uh, you see? I'm try just trying to find out if you guys are away. <laughs> right now you're thinking of food. So that meal that God has prepared for you is actually the Lord's Supper or Communion. The Lord's Supper or Communion is actually a major ordinance or sacrament that Christian, chur that Christian churches practice. The Communion or the Lord's Supper traces back to the old symbolic feast. In the Old Testament, they call it the Passover meal. If you remember, I mentioned earlier that when God delivered Israel out of Egypt, the instruction for them is for them to kill the lamb that is not blemish. They're going to roast it. And then the blood of that lamb will be painted on the doorpost of their houses. And God said that I will come, the angel of death will come, and every firstborn of every household without the blood on the doorpost of their house will die, both man and beast. So the children of Israel were having their meals together. And the Bible says, God said that when you are having your meal, you have to make sure that you have your sandals on. You have everything packed up and that you are ready to go. That was the instruction. Because when the angel of death passed by, God gave them the green light. You can go. Because at that time, Pharaoh was hardening his heart. But when the firstborn of every household of the Egyptian died, he gave up and said, okay, you can go. And what's interesting, that the children of Israel are slaves in Egypt. But when they left Egypt, they were rich. Because the scripture says that the Egyptians gave them gold, earrings, bracelets, whatever they need when they go to the wilderness. Think about that. You're going to give your possession to the slaves? Who would do that except for the mighty hand of God? So when they left Egypt, the Israelites, the Jews, the Jews were actually rich. So the Lord's Supper or the communion traced back to that day they called the Passover night. And up to this day, if you know some Jewish people, they still celebrate Passover. So God told them that you have to be ready so that when they are delivered out of 
bandage. Okay, they don't have, oh, where's my bag? Where's my bag? Oh, where's my shoes? Where's my sandal? No. They were excited. And what I am telling you right now, that when we come to the table of God, we need to have that attitude of excitement. Because the moment you take the elements, you partake of that meal, whatever bondage that is holding you, God will deliver you. Be it a bondage of pornography, be it a bondage in sexual immorality, be it a bondage of whatever it is, God is able to deliver you. I don't care what you're going through right now, but God is sovereign. He can do that. So the final meal that Jesus had with his disciples immediately before his betrayal was done on Passover day, Passover night. The Lord Supper signifies the presence of God. That is why we do not take lightly when we dine at the table. It's sad to say that many people take for granted the Lord's Supper. Many people take for granted the communion that we are partaking. And I'd like to encourage all of us, let us take the Lord's table seriously. So when we take of the communion, when we take of the Lord's Supper, God's presence is there. Psalms 23, as what I mentioned earlier, the devil cannot come near you because of the presence of God. The institution of the Lord's Supper was actually initiated by the Lord Jesus himself. It was not Peter. It was not John. But it was the Lord Jesus himself. If it was the Lord Jesus himself who instituted the first Lord's Supper, why are we taking it so lightly? In when Jesus rose from the dead in the New Testament, Two of his followers, one of them is Cleopas, they were walking on their way to the village called Imaus or Ima, Imas. Dif difficult to pronounce. Okay, and it is actually a seven mile journey. And while they were talking, because, because the, the disciples went to the tomb, they did not find the body of Jesus, they were so devastated. So these two followers were probably walking and they were saying, oh man, what happened to Jesus? His body is no longer there. Probably Peter stole the body. Or probably a lot of theories, right? And then suddenly Jesus appeared. And while they were walking, you know, when Jesus appeared to them, they did not recognize him. So when they reached the village, these two followers asked Jesus to stay with them for a meal. So they started eating. And while they were eating, they soon realized that they were eating with Jesus. What am I trying to say? When we go to the Lord's table, you will be enlightened by the Lord. 
when you go to the Lord's table, God will start to reveal himself to us. That is why when we go to the Lord's table, I discourage us to do it in a hurry. You know, we Americans here, right? It says that 20% of Americans eat in the car. They just eat. We're fond of just going to fast food. Okay, gone are the days where at 7 o'clock, everybody should be home and we, and we will have dinner. Even us in our family, it's sad to say, we seldom eat together anymore because our children, they're already adults, they have their own lives. Right? right? They have their own schedule. My wife has a different habit. I have a different hab eating habit too because, because I sleep early. My wife eats at 4 in the afternoon, her dinner. And unfortunately, I'm still working. And by around 6 o'clock, then I have my, my dinner. So we seldom eat together. We are in a rush. And many of us, when we take the Lord's table, we are in a rush. We take for granted the essence and the meaning of the Lord's table. In Luke chapter 24, to verse 30, the story that I was talking earlier, it says, Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread. Remember, Jesus was already resurrected. He took bread. Doesn't it look like the Lord's Supper? And broke it and gave it to them. And what happened? Read with me. Their eyes were opened and they knew him. So the moment they ate and had the meal with Jesus, their eyes were open. Unfortunately, many Christians don't get the promise because we have not participated proper meal with the Lord. You know, it's, it's a joy always to sit at a table with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And many, sometimes people would say, it's already 11.30. Come on, give me the communion elements. I'm in a hurry. But the Lord is asking us that we spend time with Him in the Lord's table. The meal is always ratified. The meal always, uh, the meal ratifies the start of the new covenant. When Jesus had the first communion or the Lord's Supper, it was actually a ratification of the new covenant, which Jesus initiated or God initiated for each and every one of us. Remember, in the old covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, it was God himself who initiated that. And they had a meal. In the New Testament, it was God again who initiated the covenant. How did he do that? He sent his one and only son as a sacrifice for you and for me. And that covenant was ratified through the blood of Jesus and became active when they had, when Jesus died on the cross. And they celebrated it through the covenant. And probably you may ask, what is that covenant all about? It is actually the covenant or the gospel of grace. And some of you may say, what is the gospel of grace? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, Paul writes, For I delivered to you first of all, which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. You know, Jesus did not only die of a natural death, or he, he did not die because of car accident, or somebody stabbed him, or whatever. But he died cruel death, which actually signifies death 
that requires justice. What is that death that requires justice? Because of our sin, it requires that we die because of our sins. However, Jesus was the substitute. And he said, Patrick, I don't want you to die, but I will die in your place because I love you. God was saying to Chris, Chris, you don't have to die. I will die in your place. And if we continue in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 4, and he was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the scripture. It is noteworthy that in many religions, their Savior or their God died also. They were buried, but they did not rose from the dead. It is only Jesus who rose from the dead. That is why our faith and Christianity is always anchored on the living and true God. In verse 5, it says, And he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by the apostles. The last of all, he was seen by me, Paul said, as one, as by one born out of due time. So we can see here that there are collaborating witnesses to prove that Jesus is alive. Aren't you glad that you serve a living God? A God who answers our prayers? A God that when you call on Him, He hears whatever Vivian tells God? If Malu would reach out to God, God will not say, Malu, I'm sorry, I'm too busy. God is never too busy for you. God always has a time for you. The celebration of the Lord's Supper ought to remind us we need to appreciate and worship God for what he has done. Let me unpack a little bit more. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, we always read this during communion. For I receive of the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the, night, on the same night which he was betrayed took bread. This happened during the Passover night. And I've already explained to you what a Passover is. It is a major Jewish holiday celebrating their exodus out of, of slavery in Egypt. And it was actually the last Passover that Jesus had with his disciples. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take it. This is my body, which is broken for you. I want you to read the last one. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread does not magically become the body of Christ. It is the symbol of the body of Christ. When Jesus suffered and died on the cross, he received several lashes. They beat him. They put a crown of thorns in his head. They kicked him. They spat on him. They punched him. He suffered greatly for you and for me. 
And the Bible says in Isaiah that by the stripes of Jesus you are healed. Are you sick this morning? Are you sick this morning? You might be sick of COVID for those of you who are at home. I know some of our com uh, members in church, they are suffering from COVID. Right now, I am telling you, God is able to heal you. Are you suffering of cancer this morning? The Bible says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. And when Jesus is Lord, all of the sickness will go away. Are you sick of back pain this morning? Are you having migraine? My goodness, it's just a name. And Jesus is able to heal you. Because of the stripes of Jesus, the Bible says, you are healed. There's a song of Don Moen. I am the God that he let me. I am the I don't memorize it, I'm sorry. But he's the God who heals us. Right, Dr. Anene? God heals us. And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup in the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it. And what? In remembrance of me. I went through the internet this morning. And I look at the laws in the United States. Don't you know that there is such a law in the U.S. called the blood oath? It is a blood oath. I'll, I'll read what I saw in the, in, in the internet. Blood oath is a solemn promise to keep an agreement using each party's sense of honor or reputation to uphold the deal. In the past, a blood oath requires that each party make a small cut in the right hand and actually mix blood as they shook hands. In, in Hungary, they have what they call similar to the blood oath that the seven Hungarian countries or state, they agreed to have a blood covenant that they will not fight each other and form an alliance. It is an agreement. And when Jesus was hanging on that cross, Blood was oozing out of his palms. Oozing out of his feet because of the nail. Oozing out from his head. And they pierced him on the side. Blood and water came out. That blood was God's oath or covenant of salvation. For you, Chris, for you, Cleveland, for you, Dondi, for you, Grace, for you, Joel, for me. And one thing nice with the blood or the oath that God has initiated is that he doesn't require you to do something but to believe and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. J.R., that is grace. That is grace. Jerry, that is grace. Money, that is grace. 
I don't deserve. I don't deserve it. But it is God's grace for each and every one of you. And Jesus signed that covenant with his own precious blood. That is grace. That is grace. And it says, do this in remembrance of me. Do this. I've been thinking, what does it mean, do this in remembrance of me? When you go to the cemetery, what do you see? In loving memory, in remembrance of so-and-so. Sometimes a lot of Filipinos and Mexican, they would put a sticker at the back of their cars in loving memory of so-and-so. It's, I think it's part of the culture. And when you say in loving memory or in remembrance of, of our loved ones, what do we normally, what normally comes to our mind? We think of them. Oh, I think of my grandma. She's a very nice person. She would do this, and you will think of happy thoughts that you had with your grandma, right? You will think of days that you were together. You will think of days that you enjoy each other's company. And sometimes you will say, you know, my dad is like this. I am, uh, you know, I'd like to follow my dad. I like to follow the footsteps of my dad. Am I right? In memory or in remembrance of our loved ones. Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. And what does it mean? It does not only mean that when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we remember him hanging on the cross. Yes, yeah. But beyond that, God wants us to remember him by following his footsteps. God wants us to remember him by emulating him. And how do we follow him? Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 8, it says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. But in lowliness of mind, let each and every one of us esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Many of you memorize this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in likeness of man, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. In remembrance of Jesus requires us to emulate and follow his example. And the Bible defines it in Philippians 2, 3 to 8 as Christ likeness. What is Christ likeness? Christ likeness is you mirror the attitude you mirror Jesus in your life. Christ likeness is even if somebody cuts you in the freeway, you don't change gear and chase after that guy and brings out a dirty finger. Right? It's funny when we were stuck in traffic this morning, I was telling my wife, I said, why don't, you know, why don't I just go there and, you know, uh, overtake all of these cars? And then when you reach there, all they will say, oh, Pastor Reggie, you're there. <laughs> okay. Christ-likeness. 
Christ-likeness is when you are patient in the line and that old person in the counter is having difficulty putting things in the bag. Christ-likeness is when you don't say, hey, you're too lazy, you're too slow. Christ-likeness is when you love the person next to you. Christ-likeness is if you love your siblings. Christ-likeness is even if we are on the losing side, we give up our rights. Christ-likeness is when you are willing to die for the person next to you. Christ-likeness is when we are humble. That is Christ-likeness. That is Christ-likeness. Verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. The Lord's table ought not just to be a social gathering. You know, the background in Corinthians is that they have probably a big group because they meet together. And when they meet together, probably they were influenced by Filipinos, right? Because Filipinos, when Filipinos gather together, they always bring food. Even if you tell them, don't bring food anymore. Some Filipinos will even wake up early in the morning just to cook. And when they bring their food, oh, I cook this, I cook that. In Corinth, they also have that culture. They were bringing food. And guess what? The rich will bring nice food, probably lichon or crispy manok, crispy pata. They would, they would bring that with some salads. But the poor people will probably just bring Subway or they will just bring uh, in and out Okay, and also in Corinth, when they gather together, they cannot wait for each other. So the rich would always go first and eat. And sometimes the poor are just left alone. That's why Apostle Paul was telling them, you know, when you come together to fellowship, we should not neglect the person next to us. Whether that person is rich or that person is poor. In fact, it is always best that we wait for each other. Give thanks to God. Have fellowship together. And maintaining that attitude of Christ-likeness is actually a proclamation of God's grace here on earth. Because God said, Jesus said that in verse 26, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. You proclaim that you are a Christian. You proclaim that you are saved by grace. You proclaim, as what Manny mentioned earlier, what is our role as Christians. We proclaim the gospel of grace to other people. But if we are on the Lord's table and our lives doesn't show Christ-likeness, what will people say? Oh, Christian? Christian? Come on. That's why the Bible says that when we go to the table, we need to examine ourselves. There might be some things that we are doing that is very unchristian. Okay, what are the things that, that is very unchristian? We are very impatient. Okay, we cheat on our taxes.
we don't love our spouses. Our children, they fight with each other. We are under bondage. Christian, for that matter. And you are in that last full thoughts that you always entertain. So we proclaim the Lord's death. We proclaim the grace of God until He comes. Probably some of you may ask, is the Lord's table open for everybody? The answer is yes and no. It is open if you have been washed by the blood of Jesus. But if you are not washed by the blood of Jesus, the Bible says you can be washed by the blood of Jesus. The Bible says that you can be saved because the Lord's Supper or communion is for family members only. But the good news is you can be part of that family. And the process is very simple. A, we need to admit that we are sinners and there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. B, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and the Bible says you will be saved. And C, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus that He is your Lord and you will be saved. And if you have done that, the Bible says, you are welcome, but as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So if you are a child of God, then you are part of God's family. And you can call God my Abba, Father. We are going to group ourselves into four. I think Mani has already prepared the list. And what you need to do is, this is also true for those in the south and those in the north. We will briefly share what we have learned about the Lord's Supper. I want us really to understand what the Lord's Supper is all about. Only three to four sentences because if we don't limit to three to four sentences my gosh three o'clock we will not be done and then the group leaders will institute the Lord's Supper but before you do that I want you to read first Corinthians chapter 11 27 to 32 and then we will pray for each other and after that we will have our closing song and benediction. You like that? For those of you in the north, do you like that? Those in the south, you like that? So let's do it now. Money. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Pastor Reggie. For the groupings, uh, I had a list here uh, under Tony Ong. Yeah, Manong Jerry, Manang Cora, Sister Wilma, Doctor Ane, and your group. Okay, uh, Chris Laylin, you will have Chris Laylin. You'll have Dondi, Thelma, Sister Sharon, Cleveland, and Malu. Okay, now. Uh, it's tough to be really the group of four. Among, you, amongst, among your group, you could divide it into men and women, make it smaller, okay? Uh, Carlo, so you have your list there, the whole family. Uh, Joel, you will have Patrick, Joseph, and JR. And then Annabelle, you'll have Elizabeth, Nika, Gracie, and Nina. Okay? So 
Leaders, would you stand up? Tony, Chris, Carlo, and Joel and Annabelle. Okay? So these are your leaders here. Uh, for Patrick and Diane, you join Carlo. Raise your hands, Carlo. The good looking guy here. Okay. All right. So let's try to be sensitive in grouping. Uh, we might not have enough room, so we'll just have to be a little bit in compact here. Okay. Uh, we're going to give Brother Tony Ong the responsibility for next week new building. Thank you. Okay. So it, it's going to be just a short discussion. That's why we're just grouping it into, we're limiting it to, to, to four. Or probably if we do not have leaders, we can consider up to five.